as uh, the saints are now rushing uh, into Caldwell County and being driven, and uh, you've got that going on. There will be times when Latter-day Saints will be literally captured, and depending on the militia unit, the Latter-day Saints will be tortured. And so um, as they're being tortured, uh, you get finally in far west, rising up will be this David W. Patton that says on October 25th, Let, let's go rescue those guys. And when he goes to rescue on October 25th, uh, he, he will actually rescue three, three of the prisoners that were being tortured. But on the way back, suddenly the militia will catch up and they will have a battle called the Battle of Crooked River. So remember when we talked about David W. Patton will be mortally wounded. And uh, when he is wounded, he's taken home. Priesthood men put the hands on, it, on his head. Uh, he says, I see angels. Hands are removed. And the Lord will say to Joseph, David W. Patton is with me now. Okay, two days after that battle, then on October 27th, Wilbur W. Boggs issues this infamous extermination order, which says the Mormons must be driven from the whole state. In other words, uh, we're, we, we've decided no longer will we keep them in Caldwell County. You are to drive them from the state, and you are to, if not, exterminate them, which means what? Kill, kill them. You are to kill them. Now, uh, you realize then a license to kill. The militia had already been armed, but the first killings will occur on October 30th. On October 30th, the militia has now come into Caldwell County, and a militia unit has stopped at a place called Hans, anybody got it? No. Hans Mill. Okay, people in Hans Mill, um, you'd say Hans Mill is like a tent city. Um, uh, several hundreds, literally, had just arrived from Kirtland. And um, they, uh, Han, Jacob Hahn was the big kind of owner there. He had a mill, so they've got kind of a little river going through the community. And you've got hundreds of Latter-day Saints. These Latter-day Saints, they look up kind of on the ridge of a hill, Hans Mill's down in the valley, and suddenly they see all these military men with uniforms. And they've got guns. And you know how you see something and it's so out of context? Uh, you think it's like a mirage. You know, it isn't really true. And so they come out of their houses and they look. And I see this, you see this. And suddenly one of the militia men shouts the word fire. In other words, start shooting. The militia now on their horses, they come charging towards uh, these Latter-day Saints in this little community of Hans Mill. Some of the men now yell to the women to take the, the children, get across the river and go into the forest. In the meantime, the men run to the center of town where they keep their guns. Where did men always keep their guns back then? Blacksmith shops. Okay, they go into the blacksmith shop with the idea we're going to get our guns and we're going to defend ourselves and our families and our town. But the problem is uh, the people at Hans Mill, they were poor. So what kind of guns do they have? They have the old kind of guns that were used in the Revolutionary War where you don't just point and shoot, but you gotta do about 20 things, you know, to be able to get to your gun. And by the time they've done that 20 things, guess what? The militia is now on top of the blacksmith shop. They are pushing their guns uh, through. Remember how the, the, the logs don't perfectly fit together? They're pushing them through the logs, and suddenly you look and uh, death everywhere. Now, to explain um, the difficulties of war. There was no Geneva Convention. So there was one man in Han Hans Mill named Thomas McBride. He's an older man. He had rushed to his tent thinking he could protect himself. But when he gets to his tent, he is killed. And then they took knives and they chopped his body all to pieces. Okay, and you're like, wow. Okay, so once Hans Mill has fallen, on October 30th, you now start to see militias begin to come in, and they are surrounding far west. 
as they surround the town. Oh, sorry. Okay. As they surround the town of Far West. Okay, I'm going to do the circle square. We give up the circle spot part, and we're actually willing to give up part of the square. But suddenly, leader of our troops was a man named George Hinkle. So you'd say the rest of the militia, they are called out by Governor Box. George Hinkle will call out the Latter-day Saints in Far West, as now Latter-day Saints are rushing into Far West, and the decision is made, we will protect part of the town. So recall how you protect a place. You literally decide which part, and they're going to protect the center. And uh, all of this, the circle and the rest of the outside, can all go to the militia. But they're going to protect a portion. So how you protect it, you take your wagons and you flip them over. So I flip a wagon over. I've got about a six-foot wall. You flip yours over next to me. We then get shovels, and uh, we shovel around the outside, and pretty soon they made a little fort around the portion of the town they're going to protect. You realize with cars today, we couldn't do it. <laughs> There's a downside to a car. But if you have enough wagons, you can protect any portion of your territory. So they are protecting this. In the meantime, militia units are all converging with the idea, and Latter-day Saints are running, and they're running to this protected park. Okay, George Hinkle. It's October uh, 30th, okay? George Hinkle now takes a white flag. He is a general, and all these others who are head of the forces, they are generals too. So here comes George Hinkle. He goes out with a white flag, and he meets with the generals, who all kind of come together. And the head general was a man named Samuel Lucas, and he is from Jackson County. So here comes George Hinkle. He comes out of our protected zone. He's got a white flag, and he meets now in the tent with all the generals. And the question to... Um, George Hinkle, or a question to Samuel Lucas from Jackson <coughs> County is what can he do to prevent the entire destruction of Far West? Remember our two hotels, five general stores, our blacksmith shops, let alone all of our houses. What can we do to protect this? And General Lucas says, if you get me the following men as prisoners, I will promise we will not destroy Far West. In other words, I will hold back any military force. Your town will be safe. Who does Samuel Lucas want as a prisoner? He wants Joseph Smith. He wants Joseph's oldest, oldest brother, living brother, what's his name? Hiram. Hiram Smith. He wants Parley P. Pratt. You know that guy that's baptizing everybody? He's going all the country. I want Parley. I want Sidney Rigdon, you know, the salt sermon. I want that guy, and he wants a total of nine. In the meantime, George Hinkle now comes back inside. As he comes back inside kind of our makeshift fort, he now meets with the prophet Joseph. As he meets with Joseph, he indicates that, Joseph, we can prevent bloodshed. We can spare far west if you, Sidney, Parley, Hiram, and the one's name, if you come out with me, I will carry a white flag. We'll now go out, and uh, then you talk to the generals, and we can protect this town. Joseph buys into it. Okay. He didn't tell Joseph they're taking you. No, he doesn't tell Joseph they're about to be prisoners. So here's this George, Lu uh, George Hinkle. He now, the next day, October 31st, Okay, and it's Halloween. I always think, Halloween, who would I like to dress up as? Oh, how about George Hinkle? <laughs> how about Lover and W. Boggs or even Samuel Lucas? So the next day, October 31st, Joseph, Sidney, Parley, Hiram, and others, now you've got the one white flag, they now walk out of relative safety, and they now walk out towards where the <coughs> troops have now gathered and set up their line of aggression. 
as they now come out, suddenly when they get where George Hinkle can see Samuel Lucas, George Hinkle says to Samuel Lucas, General Lucas, here are the prisoners I promised you. Suddenly, Joseph now turns to George Hinkle and he gives that man a new name. You ever wondered what's one of the first new names in this dispensation? He calls George Hinkle Judas Iscariot Hinkle. Okay, because why? He betrays the brethren. Okay. On October 30, or 31st, then Halloween, it's now nighttime. And at nighttime, here comes back George Hinkle, and he says to everybody in the town, take down the little fort. You know, in other words, go back home. Everything's fine. You know, our town's going to be fine. The militia's going to be move, moving out. But you'd say people now start to take down their protection. And in the meantime, at nightfall, what do they hear? But they hear the sounds of guns and they hear wolf cries. Now, the sound of a wolf, okay, the belief back then was that, at least by those that had gathered around the town, the, the belief was Joseph Smith is a wolf, and the Mormons, they are sheep. And so in order to protect the sheep, we kill the wolf, and then the sheep, they can go back and they can be great Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever they had been before. So suddenly, uh, October 31st is always called in church history, the night the wolves howl. So you've got on the outskirts of uh, far west, you've got guns going off, you've got this woo woo woo, and you've got these howls going on and uh, listening to it, and it will be the people in town, including Father Smith. As Father Smith now hears this howling of wolves, Father Smith concludes that his two sons are dead. Uh, so, you know, you'd say Hiram's dead, Joseph's dead. He falsely concludes this, but he now says, I cannot live but another moment, my sons are dead. Now, you realize there is physical health and there is mental health. And for Father Smith, uh, he literally collapses. So much so, he now goes home with his wife, Lucy, concluding that his sons are dead. For Emma Smith, as she hears the howling of the wolves, you know, the men howling like wolves, and the gunshots, she also concludes that Joseph is dead. Joseph and fellow prisoners are not dead, but they are now uh, strapped together and they are outside. In the meantime, inside the general's tent, okay, a court is now in session. Notice the prisoners, they're all tied up out here to a tree, and uh, they're waiting, and court is now in session with Samuel Lewis, Lucas as the main judge and jury. Now, we're going to leave the court going on, and we're going to turn our attention back to a man named Alexander who? Alexander Donovan is living way down in Clay County. In fact, he lives in Liberty Clay County, and he lives right next door to the jail. Remember, he's an attorney. Uh, Alexander Donovan's been laying in bed, and, you know, he's just had one of those court cases that's just taken it all out of him. He's laying in bed. His wife uh, now is reading him a letter signed by Lilburn W. Box. And in the letter, um, it's saying that Alexander Donovan has been given a position as a kind of general in the, um, in the um, Missouri militia. But then, you know, that's not enough to get Donovan out of bed. Why not? And because, you know, that, that's a, hey, I'm what? Okay. But suddenly he gets his first assignment as the letter goes on. And his first assignment is to exterminate the Mormons. Donovan is reported to have thrown off the covers. You know, once again... Clark Kent, Superman, <laughs> throw off the cover saying the day of extermination is over. In other words, we got to keep, uh, stop exterminating people. That, that's not how to solve your problems. And so Donovan gets out of bed. He now marches with Clay County Militia, and he arrives uh, outside of Far West. He arrives on the evening of October 31st at the very time that Samuel Lucas is now holding court against Joseph. Joseph, fellow prisoners, tied up.
ended up outside of the courtroom. Donovan bursts in. <laughs> okay. When he bursts in, every single person in that courtroom who are, you know, all the generals are there. Uh, okay, he, he holds their same rank. And he bursts in and he wants to know, do the prisoners have anyone defending them?